Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today. So our talk today is Loop, the Next Generation, Integrated and Interoperable Platform, Enabling 3D Stochastic Geological Modeling. And the presenter is Dr. Laurent Tailleres. Laurent was awarded a PhD in 1996 from the Institut National Polytechnique de Lorraine and has been at Monash University since then, where he is a senior research fellow. He specializes in structural geology, geophysics, and 3D geological modeling, and he teaches field mapping and polydeformed metamorphic terrains and advanced structural mapping and structural geophysics. His geological experience spans across Africa, Europe, Australia, and the Americas. Yes, <laughs> I think we left out somewhere there, Laurent. Um, Laurent is the lead on the Loop Collaboration Project, which is now in its second year, and he will be showing us some of the exciting results to date. Please welcome Laurent Taillere. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, David. Um, very nice introduction. Um, we've actually only been going for a year and two years yet, um, so, uh, and I'm very proud of showing you the, the, the progress we made so far. And uh, so Loop is an integrated platform and interoperable. So we want to actually build on the uh, One Geology Consortium work and build on the uh, OGC Consortium. So we're trying to, to develop a, a 3D modeling package that automatically builds models from, um, from data basically served from the geological service. The project started, uh, was initiated by uh, Chris Pygram in, uh, as a, when he was a CEO of uh, Geoscience Australia and the chairman of the uh, One Geology Consortium. And the idea is to provide a uh, piece of software that was uh, allowing us to build uh, 3D models for polydeformed terrains and metamorphic terrains like we, uh, we have in Australia, for example, and, and doing exploration in. Um, since then, the project actually snowballed a little bit, and we're looking at uh, so linking uh, looking at the input data and looking at the knowledge as a the start, uh, as an input for the software, uh, developing also the, uh, the, the modeling engine done here and also characterizing uncertainty. So it's actually now an integrative process that goes from uh, web servers and uh, feature servers to a 3D model squeeze characterization of, of, uh, of uncertainty. So I shouldn't say 3D model, it's actually a series of 3D models um, that we are producing. So going back to the slide, uh, this is our new logo and uh, our high level um, sort of workflow for the software. And what we want to do is, is in the gray box here, we really want to provide a solution for better subsurface uh, resources management. And we want to make sure that our uh, decision makers can make decisions quickly and test those decisions and change them if they're, if they're wrong. We want to make sure that those decision makers have access to uh, quantifications and understanding of uncertainty in, uh, in the resources management, but also in the, you know, understanding the distribution of different work packages in the subsurface. And to do this, we realized that we basically need to automate the uh, 3D modeling um, uh, capability, because otherwise you end up with one model per one geologist, and that model is very biased on the geologist understanding of the system. So if we have a, a, a objective approach to 3D modeling, we should be able to, um, have always the same answer and at least understand what uh, what uh, variations in the system as an input would uh, trigger as a variation in the output. So the software is built on three pillars. There is a geological knowledge manage management, which is led by uh, Boyan Broderick with a lot of collaborations from the team of uh, David Lesinski and William Francis, for example, at GI. Uh, and also includes the uh, the automated map analysis uh, work that Mark Jessel has been doing as part of the MINEX CRC in uh, University of Western Australia. The Geological uh, Knowledge Manager uh, wants to to uh, to adhere to the concept of fair data. We want to adhere to the concept of fair software in terms of um, the, the software developments. And within that uh, pillar, we develop those map to loop uh, algorithm, which is automatically generating input for 3D modeling from uh, served geological map and outcrop uh, information, so structural informations. And I'm going to show you a demo of this, uh, linked straight away with a, 
uh, modeling engines, and I can show you that we can produce 3D models very quickly uh, and automatically. We want to use uh, more knowledge, and we want to use knowledge more, which is something that Boyan Broderick um, started saying, and I really like this saying because this is exactly what we want to do, and we want to get more knowledge out of the process as well. And as part of the knowledge management, uh, we're actually encoding geological rules. So uh, formation knows that they are younger than others and they are older than others and they're faulted by these faults. And so we're actually encoding the rules of superimposition, for example, or the cross-cutting uh, rules to look at topology, spatial topology, but also uh, temporal topology. The second pillar is a, a modeling engine, which consists of a 3D structural geological modeling engine and a geophysical uh, inversions and, and modeling engine, and we're trying to really make them work together um, from the beginning or as, as early on as possible in the workflow. So we've encoded structural geological rules, and I'm going to show a bit more in details that aspect of the software, because this is where my expertise lies. Uh, but we also made a lot of um, uh, progress in developing inversion methods that combine uh, the results of the ge geological models, so, the, so basically using the uh, geological probability or lithological probabilities combined with lith um, petrophysical probabilities or distributions and trying to use that information to constrain um, the results of potential field inversions or OEM inversions. And we really, what we're working towards is developing uh, an objective function that would characterize geology and geophysics at the same time and basically uh, pro produce a joint inversion of geology and geophysics. So end up with a series of models that are both consistent with the geological input and the geophysical um, input as well. And finally, we got uh, the third pillar in yellow here. It's actually the, the third pillar is throughout the entire workshop, or workflow, sorry. And um, it consists, it, it looks at uh, uncertainty, uncertainty mapping and uh, risk mitigation. And um, we're actually looking at ascendancy through the Ensemble uh, generator that Mark Lindsay has been working on since his PhD at Monash and now postdoc at uh, UWA. Uh, so looking at checking the input data set if you want and generating uh, hundreds of models and looking at the variability in those, in those models. So this is the Ensemble generator, so stochastic uh, type simulations. But we are moving towards with the inversions of geology and the inversion of ge geophysics. At the same time, we're moving towards very complicated Bayesian systems. I'm going to show you uh, a proof of concept of what we want to do in the structural world, uh, at least. And all of this is really to look at the value information and try to inform our decision makers about what type of data and where should that data be acquired to actually maximize the reduction of uncertainty or to learn the best about what we want to learn in the system. So really to try to understand which parameters were uh, influences the, our increase of knowledge or maximizes our increase of knowledge about a given system. Uh, then here are our sponsors, and I'm going to come back to that, to, to about them at the uh, end of the talk, but basically they are uh, mainly uh, state, territory, and federal uh, Australian geological survey organizations and some uh, international uh, geological surveys as well. So the British, the French, and uh, the Canadians. And also, we also have some mining uh, companies interested as well, uh, BHP and Anglo-American through the Minix CRC uh, with uh, software vendor Macromine as well involved. So why, you, you may be asking yourself at the moment, why do we want another platform? So we already have GeoModeler, we have GoCat SQR, we have uh, LeapFrog. Why do we want to create a new platform? So first, this platform is going to be open source, so everybody can contribute to it. They can all add their own new tools, and everybody can use it. Um, our success eventually is going to be measured because uh, some of those vendor companies are going to grab our code and integrate it into uh, their commercial codes. And that would be a measure of our success, showing that we are actually producing a package that does more than uh, than what their packages do. We don't want to replace them. like They do things that we don't want to do because they're doing it very well. But on the modeling side and on the uncertainty characterization, I think there is a lot to be done, and this is what we're focusing on. So we want to, uh, to so, so the, recogni the recognition was in 2015, Chris Pagram came in and talked to Mark Jessel and I and said, um, with the current packages, we are unable to model uh, scientifically, so in a reproducible way, in a reproducible way, we are unable to model um, hard rock geology or polydeformed terrains. And uh, this is how the, pro the, the project started. 
And so, but as part of that, we now also want to characterize uh, uncertainty, map uncertainty, use uncertainty to do uh, better things. And we want to integrate geophysical uh, modeling as early on as possible in the work in the modeling workflow. Um, and as I said, so this is an open source package, and I think this is very important. And you can actually already it's already open source and it's already opened, and you can download uh, the libraries uh, at this address. And um, it might not be very uh, friendly to use, but you can you can start and then communicate with uh, with the people involved in the development of the libraries. In terms of the people involved, so we have a we we are um, aware of uh, our obligations to our sponsors. So we have a steering committee chaired by our chairwoman Karina Kemp, that uh, probably most of you know from uh, her time at Geoscience Australia. And the members are basically so myself, Mark Jessel as a representative of Minex CRC, Tim Walling for Oscope, Steve Hill for Geoscience Australia, Klaus Gesner is representing uh, all of the territory and state surveys and Matt Harrison as a representative for One Geology. And on the right hand side here are the people that are responsible for the developments and the research. So myself again, Roy Thompson is our soft senior software architect um, and he's working on, uh, on, a, on a GUI. So everything I'm going to show you today is actually put into a GUI. So the, the, the code or the command lines are going to be hidden, uh, still accessible, but hidden for people who are we have a, a knowledge manager, um, a knowledge manager, a knowledge management uh, work package manager, <laughs> who is Brian Boderick from uh, the Geological Survey of Canada, Mark Jessel for the pre-processing of the data or the messaging of the data uh, from UWA. Loop Structural is led by Lachlan Gross, uh, one of my postdocs at, uh, at Monash, um, and the geophysical modeling and integration led by Jeremy Giro at UWA with Guillaume Piro and Martin C looking at uncertainty and value of information. Um, again, they're based at UWA, so working mainly through uh, Minex ARC uh, funding. And we also have uh, Robin Amit from Monash looking at the uh, knowledge transfer and community engagements and, and um, trying to develop some case studies. So these are the main people in, in the project, but we work a lot with people at Geoscience Australia. So I mentioned already uh, David Lisinski and, and William Francis, and they've been um, uh, essential, I guess, to the to the work package uh, one, the one led by Brian Broderick, looking at uh, knowledge, um, geological knowledge management. Um, you may have seen this uh, this um, Moebius stripe strip uh, in the past. This used to be our uh, old logo. It's actually still part of our logo, and showing the the, the workflow. And so here is the knowledge management with the uh, data analysis or data. Um, Messaging before input or data pre-processing. This is uh, basically the, the modeling engine where we've combined together the uh, structural modeling with uh, the geophysical modeling, which is Tomofast or Tomofast X. And it's a question of encoding structural geological rules and doing joint. Um, so LPG is not for uh, liquid petroleum gas, but it's for lithology, petrophysics, and geophysics. And, uh, and then basically looking at, so these are our three pillars. So pillar one, pillar two, and pillar three here, looking at all the, uh, the uncertainty, or to use the uncertainty, or to characterize the uncertainty, and, um, and basically involving Bison modeling and, and simulations. And the ultimate aim is really to optimize the uh, supplementary data acquisition, uh, the type, and the location of the data to maximize the uncertainty reduction, and to basically allow um, decision making and testing of those decisions. So I'm going to go through uh, some of the uh, work packages and what we've done so far. So this is, um, I'm actually not going to talk about the, the knowledge management too much. Uh, it's a question of encoding those, uh, you know, superimpositions and, um, and cross-cutting relationships. I'm going to go straight to Map to Loop, which is a package uh, developed by uh, by Mark Jessel, uh, Vitalio Cargo, and um, and somebody else that I forgot the name right now. Sorry, but um, I will remember. Uh, and basically, this package analyzes uh, maps automatically. So I'm going to show you a demo, which is actually very similar to what I'm showing here, where you can draw a rectangle on a geological map, and that is going to then access uh, the web servers of that uh, survey. So this is here in the fitness ranges in uh, South Australia. 
and um, and the, the process is to go and grab all the data we can put our hands on. So in, in this example, we have a geological maps and all the red dots are structural information. So bedding, orientation, and um, locations. So, and the idea is to be able to draw that rectangle, grab the data automatically, do some analysis on the map, uh, grab the DTM, so put the uh, the measurements at, and the map at their proper elevations, and then create a geological model that you see on this side here automatically. And I'm going to put, to show you that process and the different steps we do uh, for that analysis. Um, and I'm going also to show you where that works. So in terms of the data pre-processing and the input, so everything which is related with data pre-processing is in orange for here. And so it feeds from uh, multiple databases. So that can be local databases, so that can be uh, DAP servers or uh, geological survey servers. Uh, it will also feed from the, the work package number one, so the Geoscience Knowledge Manager that will send uh, knowledge and data at the same time. The Loop Information Manager. Uh, the Loop Information Manager will have to deal with uh, your formats, so OGC formats. So for example, uh, can we build on the uh, GSI mail formats? Uh, and look also at your projection systems. Uh, it will do some data up and down scaling to make sure we actually don't um, uh, propagate noise. So if there is noise in the data, we need to smooth that out and not propagate the noise for the models. And then also analyze automatically the, uh, the topology. So this is uh, a bit of knowledge extraction. So there is a, a bit of um, overlap between WP1 and WP2. Uh, where they're actually both uh, generating knowledge. So the, the map to loop software in itself is providing you with uh, an automatic analysis of the topology of the maps. So it, it could build automatically the stratigraphic relationships between different formations and um, and also telling you things about the thickness of the formations and uh, the, the offset of faults and all this automatically just by looking at the maps with uh, structural measurements. So this is a good way to also check back on uh, what the maps look like and what the maps actually represents. Once you've done this, so you have a, an, an input data set that can be fed into the, the modeling engine, structural geomodeling uh, engine, so or can be fed to Nodi, can be fed to Geomodeler itself, can be set, sent to uh, Loop Structural, and uh, we create 3D models. Uh, that data set can also send, be sent, obviously, to the uncertainty engine and or to the geophysical engine as a constraint for geophysical inversions. So uh, this is a very important package, and uh, linking it with those different other modules is important so that we have uh, an integrated, uh, so I guess this is where the integration is happening. We have an integrated workflow. So the, the geological knowledge management, so this is a, a slide from uh, Boyan Broderick, uh, is basically uh, looking at a, at a simplistic, or maybe not that simple, but at a, at a almost typical cross-sections of the geology and uh, encoding the different relationships between, so overlapping, uh, onlapping, and cross-cutting relationships, and capturing the temporal and spatial uh, topology. So encoding this into a format that we can actually read and, and utilize. Uh, at this stage, um, they are uh, testing the, the software, and uh, I've been told that they're good, making a, a lot of progress, and maybe David can, can comment um, at the end of the, of the talk. Um, so how do we do the, um, the uh, automatic assessments of, of maps or, or data? So this is here an example from the work from Rani Joshi, who is a PhD student at uh, UWA. And she's looking at uh, simplifying and or upscaling the information along dry holes. So trying to make sense of the different litho codes that can be acquired by different companies um, and different codes within the same companies. Then those codes are also reported to the surveys, and someone sometimes the surveys are also trying to apply their own codes and, and may change them. And basically, it's a question of combining different uh, ways of calling the same rock different names, and also looking in the comment sections of those logs to try to uh, understand what the rocks actually is. And so they're using some fuzzy, fuzzy wadi matching algorithm to, uh, to do this. And the idea is to be able to, for example, group the tracking and design, Ben Mor Ben Moriite, blah blah blah, all these different packages through here, from the tracking and design to the trachytoid, into the same work package. So uh, some sort of a trachyte. Um, but we don't want to be uh, identifying Benedaran formations. So all these uh, different names would be 
uh, I guess, appropriate for Benadryl informations, but the last two are not. So the last two are more related to official processes and are not Benadryl information. So we need to be careful what we're lumping together and what we, we need to separate. And at the end, she's creating a, a free level uh, tesaurus. Uh, where you can, so it's basically a different scale. So what you can call the rocks at a, the larger scale, it would be an igneous rocks. And at a smaller scale, you can describe it as a mafic fine grain crystalline rock, igneous. And then at the, as a more uh, detailed level, it would be called a basalt. Once you have this information, so you, when you can reclassify your different rocks uh, down the hole, you can then also use the map and the location of the drill holes on the map to try to associate the different lithological packages to a given stratigraphy. Because when we build 3D models, we actually need to, we need stratigraphy. We need, the, to, we need to build the surfaces that are bonding different formations. We can't model um, at least at the scale of the state, for example, or at the state of, uh, of the Amosley belt that is represented here. We cannot build uh, lithological models. They have to be stratigraphic models. And uh, so you, combining this, this kind of tesaurus with the automatic analysis of the map, you are actually able to redefine a stratigraphy and look at the different relationships between the different formations, supergroups, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the arrows here are different colors, uh, different thicknesses, indicating different type of contacts, whether they're faulted, whether they're conformable, whether they're unconformable, and also the length of those contacts is indicated by the thickness of the arrows. This is one type of uh, output that uh, map to loop can generate. Um, at the same time, we're also able to uh, estimate, so using the, the orientation information, so the bedding orientation informations and the, uh, the contours or the, the lithological uh, contours, we can estimate um, the, the, the apparent thicknesses or the true thicknesses, sorry, the true thicknesses of the different formations and come up with the distributions of those thicknesses throughout the map. And in the same sense, we can uh, we can estimate the, the, the minimum throw on faults. Um, and these, these dots here represent the minimum throw on those faults. And these parameters become uh, input into the modeling process. So I think it's time for me to uh, give you an example. And what we're going to do, we, we're going to draw our example, our, our rectangle, uh, grab the data, analyze the data, and then build a 3D model. Fortunately, I did that um, earlier on this morning because the process took 42 minutes but you will see that this is quite a large area, a complicated model with a lot of data in them. But the idea is to be able to generate a data set uh, that can then be fed to GeoModeler or to Loop Structural, which is the package we're developing at the moment, or to GemPy, which is a Py version of GeoModeler. Also, GemPy doesn't have faults at the moment. And the idea is to generate that, that uh, data set that can be sent to those different packages and generate models. And you can see that all these models are, have differences. Um, they sort of reproduce the geology to a certain degree. Uh, you may want to have more details, for example, in this one here in the loop structural output. You may want to have less noise maybe in the geomodeler model. And uh, of course, you would, have, you would want to have the faults in, uh, in GemPy. But these three models are as good as, as each other um, in the sense that they're probably both wrong. And, uh, and the important thing is being able to automate the process so you can generate multiple models and look at the differences and understand where they come from. So map to loop is uh, applicable essentially in GeoSound in WA at the moment because of the funding coming from the, the Minex ARC. And the question is, is the, the, the complication is basically to link the databases from each surveys into the, the input of map to loop. Um, so those different rectangles here or, or squares have been um, set as uh, case studies. So there is, uh, for example, a project to build an entire uh, 3D model for the Amosley Basin. Uh, there is work in the Patterson, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've also linked the NTGS database with map to loop uh, also full Minex ARC again, uh, looking at the southern extension of the Montazine layer in, in Queensland. And there is a, a database linked uh, in New South Wales to look at the, uh, the Macquarie Arc, I guess. And uh, in South Australia, so this is the example I'm going to show you. We actually haven't linked databases, but this is work in progress. Uh, but I'm going to show you an example based on files that I've downloaded on my computer. So we're using a shapefile for the geology and a shapefile for the structural measurements. And we're going to uh, feed those into map to loop and then analyze um, the different results. So let me 
bring the window up. So this is here a, um, a Jupyter notebook. I'm going to hide the model for now. Uh, a Jupyter notebook. So this is uh, pretty um, advanced if you want. And this is not what we're expecting our users to use, but this is the code that you see here is going to be available for the, for the new GUI that's being built uh, so that you can modify it if you want to, or just um, use as is. So you do different things. So you're basically loading the data here. Uh, this should actually be calling uh, a, a web server uh, from GSSI and uh, uh, draw your own polygons. So we choose uh, to draw our own polygons. And this is the polygon I've drawn. So that map should be loaded automatically from the web. At the, at the, for this example, it was loaded from my, uh, from my own computer. Then I drew this rectangle for here. So it's interactive. I can zoom in and out. Um, I, can, I didn't really want to do this, but let's do zoom back out. You can also display uh, the data available. So you have geology and outcrop. And outcrop is basically bedding orientations. So we have a lot and a lot of information here. Um, and then so and then you send that data to map to loop. Uh, a few parameters are being set here, looking at the projections. And then what the software does, it, it takes all these different measurements and assigns them to a given stratigraphy um, horizon according to where they fit in on the map, on the geological maps, and provides uh, stereo nets. And the idea is to be able to ascertain, at least visually from the stereo nets, whether or not all formations can be modeled as a conformable uh, a series, or some of them needs to be grouped into supergroups or, or whatever groups, and models the different groups with um, a different scalar field and have an unconformity in between them. So we have a total of 21,000 uh, structural measurements. Uh, this is the entire uh, data set here. So you can see that there is a, a very strong east-west uh, girdle. Uh, meaning that we probably have north-south folding and uh, almost horizontal fold axis. You can see it through here. And this is what this map in the Flinders is showing. Uh, so we're doing this for different groups, the Asian supergroups, the Unberetana Umber, group, et cetera, et cetera. And so in this case, we decided that we were going to model everything uh, as one um, conformable series. Um, then the software... Uh, software is actually clever to recognize that there may be some uh, cover sequences on top of the map here. I actually don't know how this works, but this um, shows um, basically units that are not conformable. Um, and this is a representation of all the data. So these are going to be upscaled, and we're only going to use uh, a smaller percentage of that data. Uh, we also get an idea of the fault network in those blue segments through here. Uh, and then we have a, a calculation of the topology. So these are the different formations we're going to use. The, fi the first five are supergroups. So they're, uh, they're not necessarily uh, topologically related because they, they're supergroups, where this is looking at the formation level or the subgroup level, and the arrows are pointing towards older elements. So for example, this is saying that 12 is the youngest formation and pointing towards older elements. So, so for example, so 12, the Wilpena group, is older, is younger, so is a nine, which is a kind sub subgroup. And I hope I got the orientation of zero uh, right, because actually I don't know the geology of the Flinders that well, if at all. Um, so once you've done this, you can you can actually eventually we'll be able to change that topological uh, graph, and we we may be able to test different uh, geological scenarios. But at the moment, this is what it is. Uh, we're also downloading automatically the, uh, the DTM. So this comes from the uh, GA server. And, um, and we keep on going. There's lots of different checks and, and assessments. Uh, eventually, we're estimating the thickness of the formations. I'm going to pass those graphs. We're going to estimate the thickness of the formations. And so we get uh, an idea of the distributions of, of thicknesses per uh, formation. So this is information through here and represented on, a, on the map. Um, and we also estimate the, the fault offsets on different faults. So um, just estimating, just looking at the apparent offset or the minimum offset of the faults, looking at the, the thickness and the deep of the formations and their relationship with the fault. We also have a very complicated uh, topological network for the fault network. 
and we then send it to, uh, so we can send it to uh, GeoModeler if we have uh, a license for GeoModeler or loop structural, which we don't need a license for. <laughs> and you end up with a model that I'm going to show you. And that model was calculated in 42 minutes then here. And it took seven minutes of loop structural work and about 34 or 35 minutes of map to loop uh, assessment. So this took a long time because we have 20,000 uh, structural measurements. So this, this, is a, this is actually quite a lot of data, but it only took 34 minutes to, uh, to uh, analyze them. And, uh, and the modeling only took, um, well, eight minutes, uh, which is pretty good because I actually think without uh, bad mousing software, but I actually think that because of the algorithms that GeoModeler is using, the co-crigging, uh, I think GeoModeler would have fallen over because uh, 20,000 measurements is probably way too many uh, measurements to consider. Um, and at the end, you also get uh, a check. So the colors here on this graph are, are the geological uh, predicted lithologies from the 3D model calculated, and the lines are the, uh, the line work from the uh, geological map. So there is quite a good fit. We've upscaled and we've um, decimated the contours because there was too much information or too much noise uh, for, for a model. But I'm quite pleased with what the software is doing on, the, in, on that side, for example, here where you have um, a complicated geometry um, being uh, adhered to or being respected. So in 3D, it looks like this. So there is a vertical exaggeration of two. This is a very simplistic uh, visualization package but you can rotate it. It's also working in the notebook. Um, yeah, it does rotate. And you see that um, the geology, those folds, those north south folds have been modeled. It's moving very slowly. Yeah, and you can see those antiform through here with an actual surface and, and uh, a non-cylindrical fold axis. Uh, same thing through here, another antiform with a thin form in between through here, for example. And another antiform. So you see that the faults have, have an effect. It's not very visible because there is not enough uh, information on the maps about the faults. Um, they, they're all vertical because we don't have any information on their deep. And the offset is also, um, because of that, the offset is actually minimal. Um, in the future, we're going to use Bayesian inferences to actually better fit uh, the relationship between fold and faulting. So anyway, 42 minutes to build this model. I've been, uh, so I introduced GoCAD to Australia in 1996 and uh, using GoCAD to build this model, which would have been building one model. I've been building three models of the Flinders in the last um, 36 hours, just because I could. And uh, so one model like this would have probably taken about three weeks for an expert GoCAD user. So it's pretty impressive if I say so myself. So how do we do this? So let's look at the, the way we do uh, structural modeling. Um, and I can tell that I'm going to run out of time, so I may not go into the nitty gritty of uh, the 3D modeling, the structural engine, because I want to talk about the inversions. But the way we do it is basically the, the, the biggest uh, concept is a structural frame. And that means that at each location in space, we're actually defining a, um, a coordinate system which is curvilinear throughout the entire model and which is based on the uh, finest strain ellipsoid for each deformation event. So you, you have one for the folding, for example, where, the, where one of the coordinates is going to be perpendicular to the actual surface. One is going to be uh, in the actual surface, but parallel to the fold axis, and the other one is uh, perpendicular to those two. Uh, for the fault, it's the same thing. One is, so two orientations are within the fault itself and uh, one is um, along the, the throw, the other one is perpendicular, and the f uh, perpendicular to the throw direction, but still within the fault uh, surface. And the third one, of course, is perpendicular to the fault. And that allows us to model least trick folds and, and use uh, proper kinematics. So the, the, we don't use step functions, we use, uh, we, we actually reconstruct the, the, oh, I'm actually going to show that a bit later, but we, we restore the, the input data into the undeformed, unfaulted state, and then do the, the, the model and then apply the displacement again of the fault to, um, to apply the fault. And this is what you see here. So we have a, a folded fault, for example, through here. So we're able to do folded, faulted fold, sorry, um, with, a, with, a, with a structural fault. 
Uh, in this example here on the right hand side, I'm showing uh, the work that is done by Fernanda Alvaredo in, at Monash as a PhD, where she's trying to use uh, a method developed to model to simulate caste system. Uh, and she's using this method to um, generate a network of uh, intrusions. And uh, at the moment, so she's quite happy because she, she can go from uh, a dike, a feeder dike, to uh, a seed intrusion, to having steps or more dikes in the system, and then to another seed intrusion. And this is all entirely based on geometries and entirely based on the anisotropy of the host rock. So it's based on our field observations that those uh, those intrusions are controlled by the anisotropy in the host rocks, and we're trying to model those and create a scalar field that represent, um, if you want, the, that models this anisotropy and use it to propagate, um, not propagate physically, but geometrically propagate our intrusions. Um, going back to the faulting, so I know those arrows are, are wrong because this is not the, they're not the kinematics. This is how we're going to reconstruct uh, the fault displacement. So we're going to move that block to the top uh, left and we're going to move that block to the bottom right so that they uh, eventually look like this. And then once we're in that state, we can then apply the folding algorithm to calculate the fault and uh, apply again the, uh, the fault to have a, a folded a faulted fold. So this is our data before we restore the fault uh, displacement. It's quite noisy. So here we would like to try to uh, model the, the, uh, the fold axis profile, which is basically trying to uh, interpolate a line that would, um, a vectorial field that would represent the variation of the fold axis orientation in 3D. And then here is uh, what we call the fold profile, and we're trying to fit uh, um, a curve, a Fourier series, to actually explain the, uh, the geometry of the fold. On the right-hand side, you have what we call the semi-variograms, which are used to estimate the wavelengths of the uh, either the folded fold axis or the folded uh, foliation in, associated with, uh, with, uh, with the fold profile. So these are the data plotted before we restored the fold. This is now after restoring the fault. And in, so you didn't see much difference, but it's actually, um, um, in terms of the fault profile down here, it was a much better fit um, once we've restored the, the, the data. So you fit a Fourier series through that fault and, and also through the fault axis through here. And you can then interpolate these two uh, profiles. Uh, so cross interpolate those two profiles in 3D and create a, um, a, a fault model. And then you can apply the fault displacement that was restored previously, and you have a faulted fold. So we do it again, apparently. So this is the example for here. So this is this example here, with this time the proper kinematics. Um, and what we recognize is that uh, it's actually quite hard because we don't have the we don't have the value of the offset on the fault. We don't have the orientation of the offset on the fault. And very often, we don't have the wavelengths of the folds either. So uh, this is a perfect example where Bayesian modeling would work. And this graph here shows um, the sampling of that Bayesian space or the model space, if you want. But the bottom, I don't know if you can read it, but it's not important. We have different parameters. So this one is a fold displacement. This one is a fold wavelengths. And the last three are the coefficient of the Fourier series we are fitting to the, to the fold. So we're trying to at least have uh, two wavelengths or two so parasitic folds. And on this side, we again have the, the fold wavelength through here and the coefficient of the Fourier series and uh, sigma, which would be the, the fold displacement here. And those uh, density plots shows where uh, we've uh, sampled basically those input parameters and created models for. So, we, so it shows where um, our best models may have been created or how we sampled the model space, if you want, or the parameter space to create models. And this here is uh, a fold profile. So we so many fold profiles that we try to fit to that data in blue. And you can see obviously that when you have data, the uncertainty is um, so the, the the narrowness of the of the of the of the of the mini curves is um, much stronger. So it's much narrower. So the fit is much better when you have data than away from the data, and that gives you an indication of where the, the most uncertainty in the model is, obviously. So that's already telling you that uh, if you were to add more data in the system to reduce the uncertainty, 
adding data here or there in in terms of um, the fault profile would um, optimize the reduction of uncertainty in that in that sense. Um, so Bayesian modeling is uh, so I'm moving on now to the geophysical world, um, and this is the world the, the work of uh, Jeremy Giro at UWA, and uh, Jeremy has been uh, developing new tools in Tomofast, and uh, the new software is now called Tomofast X. And basically, the idea is, I'm not going to go into details for all of these parameters, but the idea is really to integrate uh, the petrophysical data and the statistics, to integrate geological information, so coming from the 3D geological uh, workflow, so looking at uncertainty and volumes, looking at lithological probabilities, um, of course, using the geophysical data, so magnetic data, gravity data, seismic and EM eventually, and try to combine this data set into an inversion schemes that will uh, provide those outputs. And the systems will be um, constrained by either cost gradient constraints, so which means that we can uh, do joint inversions, uh, we can do guided inversions, and I'm going to show you an example in the next few slides where we use MT to guide the gravity inversions. Uh, we're also obviously going to use petrophysical constraints and domain clustering. And again, the domain clustering can come from uh, the geological modeling and or guided inversions. And at the end, we need to be able to assess our models. So we're going to end up with uh, physical property models that we need to transcribe into geological models. Um, and I'm going to show you how we can do inversions in an implicit sense. Um, as, as a very uh, proof of concept uh, stage at the moment. And and then we can look also at the petrophysical field and the structural uh, match, so how, how well the inverted model actually fit with um, our knowledge, you know, geological knowledge, including final model versus the input model. Um, so this is work in progress, and Jeremy has been working very closely with Lacan Gross, who's developed the structural modeling engine. So they're actually thinking that uh, they use mathematically the same methods to solve different problems. So it should be very um, easy. I shouldn't say easy. It is possible to probably combine uh, both methods into one objecting function to do joint geology and geophysical inversions. So the idea again is to use uh, all of our constraints. So the, this is the lithological, petrophysical, and uh, geophysical uh, modeling engine. And I'm going to show you some uh, some example here. And um, so this this is showing uh, inversions of gravity using the implicit uh, formulation of the model and just deforming those um, basically deforming the geology so that the topology is, is maintained to a degree and uh, we better fit the uh, the gravity, obviously. So this is the, the true model. This is a model we want to roll cover. So from there, there is a, so this color bar on the side is a density, for example, that were inputted in each of the um, different lithologies. A gravity field, a synthetic gravity field was generated. And then we tried to use that gravity field to recover that cross section from the starting model that is not um, similar. But so the topology is roughly the same through here. And uh, what we're trying to do is then uh, invert the gravity to improve, to fit the gravity signals uh, of the, from the synthetic to the, to the observed and change the geology. So deform the geology, deform those different bodies um, implicitly defined to a better fit the gravity data. So you can see that we're going towards, this is not perfect obviously, uh, but we're going towards, uh, this is fitting the gravity data, so at least this is consistent with the gravity, and it is consistent with the, uh, what we know about the geology in terms of topology, but not necessarily in terms of geometries. Um, here is another example, so this is how the, the software basically works. It's really uh, looking at, the, at deforming geological objects. In this case, they're very, uh, they're not geological objects at all, they're spheres and, and uh, polygons. Uh, this is a true model and using a, a set of uh, level set functions, um, we can we can basically uh, invert the system, deform the system in an implicit sense, and um, almost recover the, uh, the true model. There are, of course, it's not perfect, and, and we, we're not expecting it to be perfect, but what's interesting is that uh, this blob of uh, yellow lithology down here is actually removed and, and moved here where it actually belongs. So it is, the system is also able to change the topology of the initial model. 
And below is a, is a bigger example from the Pyrenees. So Jeremy has done his, his PhD in the Pyrenees in France. And this is an inversion at the very last scale. So this is 60 kilometers or 70 kilometers down here. And looking at different at a, at a multi-layer uh, system for the geology under the Pyrenees and looking at the Pyrenees route through here and uh, using the same type of approach. So deforming uh, geology or deforming an implicit formulation to try to minimize the misfit in the, in the gravity data or gravity inversions. Yep. And the last example is in, uh, in, in actually going to pass this one just because I think I'm running out of time. Um, and I'm going to talk about this one because this one is very interesting. This is an example. This is the true sections once again. And the true sections as uh, so the geology has uh, resistivity attached to it and density values attached to it. And what the, what um, Jeremy did is basically did a, an empty inversion first and use the MT to domain the, the section. And there are three domains. There is in white here is uh, a domain where the basement is not allowed. So we're not allowing density associated with the basement in that white domain. The red domain down here is where uh, the cover is not allowed. So only basement. And so we only use uh, the basement during the subsequent gravity inversions. And in black is the unknown. So it could be basement or it could be um, cover. So uh, at the bottom here, you have two examples. You have uh, the inversion of the gravity without the MT domaining. So we, we've learned something from the MT we, and we used it to domain the section. And in this case, we didn't use that knowledge. And we have a, a, um, an inversion of the gravity, which is consistent with the gravity, but doesn't recover any basement at the bottom left here. Where we use the empty domaining because we've learned something from the MT, we're actually able to recover the basement in the bottom left of the sections. And again, the inversion is not perfect, but the trends are there as a very large scale. And uh, this is work in progress and very promising once again to not only uh, do joint inversions, but more guided inversions where we learn from one data set uh, and use that learning to constrain the next inversions and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure why I've got this slide here, but I'm going to keep moving. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the, the, the conclusions, looking at looping numbers, because I think this is uh, another success of the project. Is, um, we started with basically uh, seven in-kind uh, chief investigators and, and nine uh, partners with investigators. So basically there are seven people from universities and, and nine people from um, geological surveys uh, internationally and, um, and in, in Australia. And we were able to actually create four new resource positions. So one at Monash, two at UWA, one in Canada, three new software design and development positions, uh, and 10 new PhD students. So this is the, the, the snowballing effect in terms of the human resources is, is fantastic. We have, a, we have an awesome research group. Um, we also attracted seven new PIs uh, at partner organizations, so that's people that actually joined the projects uh, after the fact. And uh, as I usually say, the, the sun never set on um, on loop because we're now working with uh, so four universities, four national geological survey organizations, um, most of the Australian state and territory geological surveys as well. And we uh, we're collaborating with within five countries, three continents, blah blah blah, all these numbers. But what what's really important here is really the uh, human resources aspect. And we're basically generating the next generation of, of generating the next generation, yes, of uh, researchers in in the field of three uh, D geology. And these are so we had a, a meeting in in Baselton in March just before everybody had to go home and and lock down. And this is basically the, the research group for here. So you will probably recognize some. Uh, so Simon van der Villen here, uh, Dutchy Ryan Dutch from South Australia. Um, David is here somewhere. <laughs> I can't see him. And uh, so we had a fantastic meeting talking about the progress and, and the future work. Um, and we are a very friendly group. So feel free to join us as well. And also the important people are funding organizations. So these are. Uh, the organizations are, are collaborating with us in the in the research, but these are the very generous organizations that have uh, provided cash and in kind as well uh, to leverage uh, with the IRC a, uh, um, a linkage grant, and we're also collaborating with the Minex IRC uh, and the mining industry, BHP and Anglo American, 
And uh, and so without these people, we basically wouldn't be able to to do what we're doing. We would still be doing our little projects um, separately because we we actually started doing these things before this larger project. But bringing everybody together is is uh, so the collaborative access aspect of the project is very very important. I'm going to pass this one, and so I guess I'm going to conclude on on this slide. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Laurent. Um, so now we're going to be opening it up to general questions from the audience. Um, if we can have that enabled. Um, questions will be submitted on the chat, and I will, um, I will read them to Laurent so that he can answer them. And if we don't have a chance to get to those uh, questions, we'll ask uh, Laurent to revisit them um, and he'll send them out. So um, one question that we had come in earlier that I'll just start on was from uh, James Johnson in, in uh, regards to how quickly that everything ran and he was asking about whether this was done on HPC. <laughs> no, so this is the amazing thing. It's running on my little laptop here, which is an Inspiron 15 7000. I don't know what it means, but it's not. I, I used to have those uh, super duper laptops that I couldn't carry anywhere uh, to, to run this kind of packages. So it's running, and I was doing other things. It was running in the background, and it took 42 minutes on a very simple laptop. Um, mm. It can run on AWS. Um, and I guess the question is, so for example, if, you, if you're thinking about the entire uh, Amosley Basin, um, so Mark Jessel has been trying to do uh, tiles, one degree by one degree. And um, the tile, what's amazing is, well, it's not amazing because we made it happen, but the tile match, so geology between the tiles match. And so this is where you could start using HPC if you want to build very large models. So one, one node or one cluster of nodes would be doing one part of the world and et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have a question from Ron Hackney, first off saying, um, Great overview, Laurent, uh, very impressive. Are there plans one day for capability to do structural <laughs> restorations? So there is no plan to do that, but I think we're doing them. Um, the way we're modeling, so the way the structural frame works is actually unfolding and unfolding. Um, so this is always at the back of my head each time we, we do these things. Uh, I really think we're actually doing so. So I, I am very um, contrasted because I always thought doing a restoration in hard rock terrain was um, impossible because we're missing the important bit, which is a lack of volume. Yeah, or the, sorry, the, the variation of volume, whether we're gaining volume or we're losing volume by through deformation. Um, so I think we're not going to be able to do proper restoration, but in a, in a sense, the way we're modeling at the scale of the model, so at the, if you consider the smoothness and the upscaling of the data and everything like this, we are actually doing restorations, I think. <laughs> so this is, this is really unclear because this, this is not the product we've, we've been trying to develop, but really the structural frame, if you, if you if you if you remember what the stratigraphic grid in GoCAD is, uh, basically the, the change from the uh, UVW UVW coordinate system to an XYZ system to a Cartesian system, uh, that's exactly what we're doing, in an implicit sense for the folding and the faulting. So, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, Steve Hill sends out a thank you, Laurent. It, it's good to see such impressive progress and engagement. Really appreciate you making the effort to present as part of our seminar series. So, yes, thank you very much, Laurent. That's my um, pleasure. I had a question about the test models. Um, what is the team doing to run tests for the uh, to compare different structural model engines and to see how well they replicate things? You gave a few examples. Um, there was lots of questions in there. So, so, so the, um, in, if you want to compare the difference, so, so first, uh, loop structural is one of the algorithms, but we use in there, we use uh, a DSI type approach. So this is uh, the algorithm in GoCAD. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a smooth, it's a, almost a spline if you want, but we've also in, implemented a, a, a final difference interpolator 
And then those, those are also uh, constrained by structural uh, information, by the structural frames. But we also give access to people to GemPy. We want to give access, people to access to um, GeoModeler. Um, so, so we are not limiting loop structural or, or loop, I should say, because loop structural is only one module of it. We're not limiting loop to one algorithm. And I think this is a strength of our approach is um, if you think about it, all of the surfaces we're trying to model have been made for a different process in uh, full geological time. So the interpolator should actually be different for some reason. I, I don't know which, which interpolator should be used for, for bedding. I don't know which interpolator should be used for uh, actual surfaces, for example, or faults or all these things. But there is research to be done in that sense to optimize the type of, of, of interpolators we use for different geological objects. We haven't done anything on, on that at the moment. What we're doing at the moment is really um, testing that loop structure all works and it sort of works. We understand why there are differences in, in between GeoModeler and, and, and loop structural, for example, in that Amersley uh, image I showed. Um, so the GeoModeler is way more uh, noisy and, and loop structural is, is less noisy. It's, it's, it's all in the regulariz regularization term uh, and we're using different algorithms. So GeoModeler is based on co-crigging. Um, noise may be emphasized. Uh, we're using a very smooth, we're using almost DSI on this one, so it's a very smooth outcome. Uh, but this is all dependent on the on the mesh you're using in the background as well. So, so the calculation in, in loop are based on a tetrahedric mesh. So if you make it uh, higher resolution, then you may need to be using HPSA. Um, but uh, and it will run on HPC. It actually runs on AWS uh, with no problems. Uh, we haven't tried on the HCI, but that's probably a, a good thing to do in the future. Um, but yeah, if you increase the resolution of the mesh, the, the, the support calculation mesh of a loop, then you would uh, you would capture more um, irregularities in the in the geology, if you want. Yeah. Did I answer your question? I thought there was another aspect of it, but um, um, well. Yes, you did. I mean, in, in part, the other aspect is that um, you've been using the Hammersley be in, par in part to do some of these tests because there's so much data available. Um, but that doesn't mean that you won't be running tests for other geologic terrains and examples as well. No, no. So we, so we run tests. So, the, so there is this slide where I showed uh, the, the Australia and the different areas. So WA is a, is a focus because Map2Loop uh, was developed mainly through Minex, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but we, we are linking up uh, with uh, Northern Territory. So we've done a test in um, the Greater MacArthur Basin. Uh, we've done a test, a Southern extension of uh, Montaiza. Uh, we've done a test with New South Wales in um, in the Macquarie Arc. And then there is a test happening in, uh, in South Australia in the Flinders Ranges. It, it's just a question we, we should be able to do. So this is a danger as well, yeah? We should be, as long as we can link uh, map to loop to your servers, then we can extract the data and we can do a model. The problem is at the moment we don't do intrusions. It's coming, but we don't we don't we don't deal with intrusions very well. And you still need um, you still need uh, the expert knowledge of the geologists to make sure that the produce model is uh, is okay, is realistic. Because we will produce a model. There's no issue there. It's very easy to produce a model, but it, it, most of them are going to be rubbish. So you need to uh, to keep the expert eye. Uh, to make sure we're not empowering people, you know, with no geological knowledge to build models too quickly. Uh, you covered off. Um, one question that came in early, I don't know if you know the answer to this, is uh, when you mentioned in the knowledge manager, the development of the hierarchical thesaurus, um, do you know what standard that's based on? I believe it's based on GSIML because Boyan and Steve Richards have been very um, engaged in developing GSIML but I guess that you probably weren't across that one. I, I actually, I don't know that detail, uh, but yeah, I would, um, I hope it's GSIML because that would be a very good way to add value to that, um, to those years of research, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, the, the ontology that they're developing is, is, is roughly built on GSIML, yeah. so we would expect that the, the source would be. Um, so we've come up to uh, noon. Um, James Johnson had the comment, great presentation, Laurent, we can really see the original vision becoming reality. And I think that's very true. And um, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation today. It was great. It's, it's wonderful to see so much progress. 
Um, and we look forward to seeing you back again to give us up more updates. And you're also talking about running some webinars. You want to give a plug there? Yes. So we we uh, we're offering loopinars to all the to all our sponsors, um, and also an exec uh, discussion for the future of Loop. But uh, the loopinars are going into details of each of the work packages. So um, we just need to set up a date, and then you'll have Mark Jessel, Mark Lindsay, Guillaume Pio, Lachlan, myself um, presenting on more details of it. So, so they go for about three and a half hours to four hours, and we present uh, in more details the work. So we will be uh, passing that information out through the internet to make sure that everybody's aware of it when that information becomes available. Yep. So uh, thank you once again, Laurent. And uh, next week's uh, seminar, before I go, um, just wanted to announce it, is uh, Next week will be Catherine Waltenberg, and she will be presenting an isotopic atlas of Australia, a window into the geological evolution of the Australian continent. So if you want to see the uh, abstract, it'll be posted online. So thank you very much, Laurent. It'll be posted online. So thank you very much, Laurent. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure.